I am convinced that I am destined to be the worst person in everyone's eyes. Mesdames and Messieurs, garçons et filles, jokers of all ages, welcome back in to the Worst Fantasy Show. I am your host, the Worst, Jack Lucene, aka the Fantasy Joker. But today I've brought in a guest, and he's one of the best, especially when it comes to what we're talking about today, which is going to be the top 10 rookie running backs uh, coming in uh, for 2024. For fantasy, welcome back to the show, Mr. Jeremy Popelars. Oh, yeah, welcome back to the show, Jeremy. Hey, thanks for having me on. I, I like the intro. It's pretty, uh, pretty intense there. Good old gladiator. You know, you've got a Sue Greyhounds hoodie on. That's pretty epic, to be honest. Uh, I remember playing like NHL 18 or whatever they had, and they had like be a pro mode. I used to always pick the Sue Greyhounds. Man, Sue are so fucking good. <laughs> Shout out to Shorzy. Uh, which is a hilarious reference because they say that on the on the show all the time that the Sioux are so fucking good. It's like the the hardest team for the Sudbury Blueberry Bulldogs to beat on the show, and it's because in real life, like yeah, the Sioux Greyhounds are actually quite renowned as a hockey team in terms of like an amateur hockey team, and uh, it's very popular the Sioux Greyhound games up in Old Sioux Saint Marie because really there's not a lot to do there, uh, <laughs> but. I got to say, I've been to a couple of Sioux Greyhound uh, games myself back in the days of uh, when Jeff Carter was uh, captain of our team. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's been a long time NHLer at this point. Uh, we got a couple guys actually in the NHL that we've sent through, not just from Sioux Greyhounds, but from Sioux St. Marie, Ontario in general. Shout out to Mike DiMatteo, uh out in Vegas. Uh, but this is not the hockey podcast. This is the <laughs> worst fantasy show. And I brought you in today because running backs very much uh, in your domain and forte, I would say. Uh, so I really wanted to get you on the show for this one. And we're going to basically crack through our top 10 fantasy running backs coming into the year of 2024. Obviously pre-draft because... I don't know about you. My whole list will change as soon as draft position settles these guys a little bit. Um, but there were definitely uh, a lot of guys that caught my attention. I think this is a deeper class than people were giving it credit for. So uh, we're going to go from uh, the number one all the way down through to number 10. And then we can maybe throw in a couple honorable mentions at the end. Uh, but let's start with the guest. Uh Let's start with your number one running back. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it's been ever changing. And I think the combine kind of gave us a little bit more. I really it's kind of like a four to five way to I'd really say, like you kind of said, that the, the NFL draft is going to kind of clarify a lot of this for us at the running back position. Um, but right now I have Trey Benson out of Florida State. Obviously, a, a little bit bigger bodied guy. He has that lengthier frame at six foot one. Definitely a physical type of runner, speedster. He has his own issues as well as everybody else in this class. Like you said, it's a little bit deeper in a way, but it's also not. I don't think we're ever going to get really a crazy running back out of this grouping. I think we got some good offset and off speed type pitch running backs that are going to have that ability to give us some fantasy viability, but I don't know if we'll get a top. 12 consistent type of guy uh but trey benson could be that he's gonna have to work on a little bit but coming in at that six foot one 215 with 
four, four speed is really a, really a good option here for Trey Benson. He's one of those guys that has that physical freak as well as has put some good stuff on tape to go with it. He was also my number one, uh, as much as I actually, you know, I felt like I came into this process. First of all, I don't watch uh college ball so i kind of came into this process very fresh and just from what i had heard and you know based on the physical i actually kind of expected braylon allen to be my number one but trey benson the tape just really uh that passed the eye test for me and one of the things that he does that i i really loved uh was he does a lot of like slalom runs and you know when you have kind of that breakaway speed and the ability uh, to pull that off, that was something that to me could translate at an NFL le- level, and especially um, the lateral quickness for a guy his side size was something that really leapt off the screen for me. So I, I agree with you that for now, he's he's my number one. Yeah, and I, I Braylon Allen was my number one for up until the combine. To be honest, I, I really need to see Braylon Allen run a forty and go from there because. I do really enjoy Braylon Allen and it could change, like I said, but a lot of what it seems like all the advanced metrics, all of the data that Braylon Allen's putting out there outside of physical play on the football field is very yucky. (laughs) Let's put it that way. Um, So I have felt the need to kind of push him a little bit, but this there's a group of five that literally I have are all exactly basically the same rank and it's going to come down to landing spot and honestly draft capital to determine kind of these five in my opinion so all right so my number two guy uh very much enamored with blake corm out of michigan uh to me the the comp is you know and i this isn't to say that i think he's going to be as good but he he's a little mjd-esque maurice jones drew kind of that mm-hmm. same build and speed compact uh, I really enjoyed uh, the patience. The measurables, really. Um, you talked about the 40. I honestly wish more guys would be uh, running the three cone and shuttle like they were back in the day. Because uh, I feel like that gives you even a little bit more than the straight line speed of the 40. Um, so, And he was really impressive. Again, sub seven seconds on a three cone. Uh, when you're his size, it was a six, eight, two, three cone, four, 12 on the shuttle and then 27 on the bench, uh, which was really impressive. You even shared, uh, I believe the tweet, uh, I think it was him and, uh, the offensive lineman there, Blake alt, uh, and Mm -hmm. it was the form you mentioned, uh, specifically. And yeah, that's exactly form and technique, uh, was something I noticed in his game. And I think that is going to translate at the NFL level. Uh, I I had a hard time, honestly, not putting him at one. To me, Trey Benson has the chance to be just a little bit more special if he lands in the right situation. But I think Blake Corum is kind of right there, lockstep. With, With those top guys, again, you mentioned being able to shuffle all these guys around. I very much felt that way. Uh, through this entire process, honestly, from one to 10 and even getting down to the honorable mentions. Uh, and that's why I felt like it's a deeper class, maybe more in the sense of, yeah, there's not, uh, like the crazy great prospects, like the, you know, the generational guys, I feel like there is a huge crop of like really good, solid talent, uh, coming into the NFL at the running back level. And that's going to muddle things up it almost feels like uh for you know a lot of these nflers already in the nfl yeah no i agree i i really like blake Corum's game um and like you said the the level of talent that's in this grouping of running backs is solid we'll put it that way like you said it's gonna muddy a lot of waters and they're gonna have some very good specific type of roles uh mjd was one of my comps as well for blake Corum. Um, I also really liked kind of the lateral agility and his ability to kind of accelerate really reminded me a lot of like Aaron Jones. Um, he He's a very similar athlete to what Deuce Vaughn was to at Kansas State. Obviously, Deuce Vaughn didn't really pan out a ton so far in his rookie year in Dallas, but that's yet to be written. Um, so I do like Blake Corum. I think he's a very physical type of runner. 
he is not my number two. But I think with what Blake Corum gives you is what he is. We've seen what Blake Corum is as a runner. There's not much to develop for him. I think I think that he has pretty solid vision. He's a really good lateral quickness type of player. Like you said, he has good acceleration and he's not afraid of contact by any means, although only being five foot eight. But I mean, he's a thick 210. And like you said, I I had a small stint where I was a uh, a bodybuilder, not a bodybuilder, but I was going for powerlifting. And the, the, the technique that Blake Corum has on the bench is is legit. Like that's that's perfect technique if when it's coached like so. That's the reason he was able to really do 27. I mean, he's obviously strong as hell. I mean, you're not doing 27 or 225 if you're not strong. But the the form is what really helps him where you're watching with Joe Alt and stuff. I mean, it wasn't terrible, but it was a lot more of that that rebounding off the chest. I mean, Blake Corms was like 27 straight up legit bench reps. So I'm excited to see. I, I really think he could end up being my running back one. Uh, especially if he falls in, in Los Angeles, which I really do think he's going to end up. I think Harbaugh will try to draft him at some point. And if that's the case, there's a good chance he'll probably be my running back one just because, yeah, he's going to be 24 when he enters the league. But, at you know, your running back, you're getting two, three years out of anyways. So he can give you that, that 24. He'll get 20, get you to 27 and move on. Yeah. But my number I... two. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I just was going to say, if he lands with – I loved everything about his tape. It's like even if he doesn't land with Harbaugh, uh, I would be still pretty enamored if he landed somewhere where he could have a primary role. But if he lands with Harbaugh, like to, to me, that almost locks it in, of, especially with Eckler being older now uh, and you're projecting, especially in any kind of dynasty format, like that would be almost locked in for me of even if you have to eat that first year. Um, but sorry, yes, go ahead uh, with your number two. So mine's uh, going to be still a question mark, but I still I really like Jonathan Brooks. I think that Jonathan Brooks kind of exploded onto the scene and you'll get the guys who are going to try to discredit it being a one year wonder. But we do have to remember B. John Robinson, Roshan Johnson. It's been a long line here in the last few years of these Texas running backs being high quality running backs, and that will probably continue. Uh, they have a good couple of running back prospects as well in their line coming up still. But I really do like um, what Roshan Johnson or Roshan Johnson. I do like Roshan Johnson too, but I like what Jonathan Brooks gives you coming in at six foot, just over 200 pounds. He's a dual threat type of athlete. He can catch the ball well. He can line up outside, run some decent routes. They're not crazy good, but uh, enough that he's going to be asked to do at the NFL level. I think he's a pretty patient runner as well. And he's also very, very good at running with solid pad level at times. Um, he is taller so that we do see that being an issue sometimes. So I do worry a little bit there. And obviously the question marks of him coming off the ACL injury, what are we going to get? Um, and how is he going to look? We're obviously probably going to take a, a red shirt year in quotations as college goes. Um, in 2024 here, but I do think that the long term for Ro or for uh, Jonathan Brooks could be really beneficial, and I think it's going to come down to landing spot and draft capital really with him because we're not going to get any of those tests. But this is a guy that like I have him comp to like the Tony Pollard's, the Rashad White, that dual threat kind of explosive ish type of athlete that can kind of make any play into something big. Um, Delvin Cook in his prime, something to that extent is really where we're looking at here, the high end here for Jonathan Brooks. And depending on that spot, I think there's some spots out there that have some pretty good. It's going to be tough because the free agent running back market's really good at this point in time too. A little bit older guys, but really good. So depending on where, but I mean, if he finds a really good spot somewhere in like those Houston or, you know, even Los Angeles, if they don't go with Corum and, and there's a route to volume, I think Jonathan Brooks could easily make a case for the running back one in this class, but he's at two for me right now. Yeah. I mean, I have a much further down on my list and it is very much exclusively, I would say because of the injury and how late it was, uh, cause it happened in November. So it's really only been like, uh, five, six months since he had that injury. And like you mentioned, he's going to miss probably, uh, most, uh, I would say the first year now science has kind of changed the game um and certain guys come back from it especially when it's just the first one it feels like now uh the acl tear is not uh automatic kind of career under like it was way in the past and even you know more recently it feels like guys are coming back quicker and quicker from it uh where it's not affecting them as much 
Um, and now it's all about kind of the level of the structural damage and what happens around it. So, yeah, that's definitely going to be a huge question mark for him specifically. But I agree with you that uh, if we didn't, if that had not happened to him, he would be much higher on my list as well. I probably would have had him uh, at number three or even number two, like uh, like you do. So speaking of number three, though, who do you have at number three? Mine was Blake Corum. So I mean, we don't have to really okay. hammer so then, that home. This, we is where, um, this is where Braylon Allen fell in for me. Uh, when you talk about, again, Jonathan Brooks getting pushed down because of the injury, for me, he's actually all the way down at six. Because uh, at that point, I would just take some of these guys that really – you know, Braylon Allen, the size and how young he is, I do think there are some limitations. Um, now, it's not necessarily that he can't be used in the passing game, but he definitely wasn't asked to do that very often. And so I think beyond the fact of that he didn't uh, post a 40, the biggest thing for me was, yeah, I needed to see more from passing game and the fact that you're also not going to post more. It's like those two things are definitely, I feel like, going to hinder him a little bit. But the size, the game speed, he does come across to me as very James Conner-esque. Um, I, I thought that was like an appropriate comp for him. He's kind of a decisive one-cut runner. He does, I feel like he could develop some hands. And if he does that, that will really translate at the next level. Um, again, I, I kind of need to see more from him in that perspective, but he also did at least post 26 on the bench. Uh, so, you know, Blake Horn beat him by one, but I, it would have been kind of like, um, I would have been more chagrined to see him post like 18 to 20 at his size, uh, and kind of get really like outclassed as opposed to like, he still put up 26, which is, uh, pretty good for a running back. Um, so Overall, I think um, for me, he kind of slots in at number three. And of all of these guys, being that he's so young, I feel like he could still develop into potentially being, you know, um, the one guy in this draft that actually was great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I had Braylon Allen one for the longest time. It's just when we start to dive into like those, those advanced type of metrics that we really like to look at for running backs. So for example, missed tackles force per carry um, since 2020, he is ranked. Where is he? I just passed him. I think 64th of the 114 people that I have data on and his missed tackle rate is only a 0.24 per carry, which is not very good. The people that he's around are like Keyshawn Vaughn. Um, Jonathan Taylor was in this area too. So there are outliers and obviously Taylor being a Wisconsin guy could have something to do with it. Maybe it's the offensive line, not needing to necessarily force as many missed tackles, but he's in that area. Damian Pierce is down here, Brian Robinson. So there are some names that are, have hit to an extent, but that paired with kind of what he gave us at the combine, which was a lack of explosion and like the vertical, obviously he did well in the, in the, um, bench but the vertical the broad jump like those were a little bit underwhelming for him considering he's kind of a freaky like athlete as well like much like Blake Corum you know he's a pretty shredded dude at six foot two two thirty five so I was hoping for a little bit more from him I guess I mean like you said the the 40 isn't is a little bit overrated it I would agree with you as well there like how often do you see a guy and now honestly Barry Lynn Allen has some of those in his college career where he basically had a gap and he ran straight for 40 yards but there was a rumor that he could run a four three and I want to see this because sometimes the tape doesn't say he can run a four three. Um, so I really kind of want to see the main issue too, with Braylon Allen is injuries. He's had a lot of them throughout his Corrigian career. And we kind of can use that as an indicator that that might continue into his pro career. Now it's not a guarantee. Obviously injuries are hard to predict if not at all it's possible to predict. And I don't want to lay that on him as an injury prone type of player already. And he hasn't even played snap, but 
there's just a lot of question marks around him still. I do like him. He's a converted player. He's a very good pass blocker. I think he actually has really good hands. I've, I know I've posted clips in the past. Like he's had some pretty sick one handed grabs out there. He has good hands. He's just like you said, he wasn't asked to do it at Wisconsin and they don't, you know, we had that same argument with Jonathan Taylor when he was coming out, like everybody was like in Ken Walker the same way, like the college offenses, some offenses just don't throw to running backs. It's plain and simple. Um, he caught a lot this year. So, I do think that that's in his realm and with capabilities. The question really is going to come is what the NFL thinks of him. And that's where I have dropped him kind of to four. And like I said, my top five, honestly, is going to come down to draft capital and where they land. All five of these guys I can make a case for to be the running back one. I can also make a case for them to be running back five. So I really think that there's a lot of fluidity here. And I just think so far, these not great advanced stats, the, lack of what I saw from him at the combine as far as like the explosive type of drills and we'll probably get him to run a 40 at his pro day. He'll probably maybe run a shuttle or something there. If we get that and he kind of gives us a little bit more, I'm all in to move him up. If he gets good draft capital, I'm all in, but there's a lot of stuff that seems like he may also be falling a little bit in the NFL's eyes. And if that happens, I'm going to kind of listen a little bit. I'll, I'll still be drafting him in spots because I think I agree with you, Jack, that like, the highest ceiling is probably Braylon Allen out of this class, but I'm not going to take him in the first or early second. If the NFL only drafts him in like the fifth round or the late fourth, and he doesn't run a four, three forty. So until we get a little bit more information on Allen, he's actually my four. So, so I'm going a little bit deeper. So we don't even got to cover my fourth. Um, so I just think that the ceilings there, the right offense and the right fit, I think Brandon Allen could easily and should probably be the running back one in this class. Like you said, the age helps them a little bit, but we've made that argument before. Isaiah Spiller is a guy we can argue and go back and say, oh, he was young, good profile. He should be good. We should be drafting him. Just never was anything. He couldn't learn the game. So there's issues um, and there's question marks, but there is with all of these guys. And so I moved him to four just because I haven't really gotten that confirmation yet that maybe he does have that speed that's quote out there for him and that explosion that we really don't totally see on tape. So speed and explosion is the perfect segue into my number four, because not only did he show out at the combine, but when I talk about eye test, when I put on the tape for this guy, he was maybe the player that had me the most excited and that's Jalen Wright out of Tennessee. At 5'10", 210, kind of a traditional build for a running back, popped a 4'3", 840, 38-inch vertical, 11'2 on the broad jump. Uh, he, he also showed ability to break arm tackles. Uh, he had a lot of uh, – he had some good vision and burst in the hole. He can do work in the receiving game. And he just is a uh, an explosive home run hitter. Like to me, when I watched him, uh, he was legitimately like, um, it was hard to even find a comp for him because it's like I wanted to almost say like uh, kind of a slightly slower Chris Johnson, you know, uh, one of these guys that like when he hits that hole and gets that one cut, it's like goodbye. You're not going to see this guy until he's in the end zone. Um, and you know, he, he could be scary depending where he lands. Uh, so for me, I had him as high as my number four. That's really, I mean, it's higher than mine. I, I don't, I can't fault you. I mean, you, like you said, he was a huge combine riser for me. I talked about it on the FTN dynasty podcast and I did the recap on the combine. I think that he helped himself outside of Isaiah Carundo. I don't really think that there was anybody who you could say helped themselves better at the combine at the running back position. So the tape has always been pretty questionable with Jalen Wright. Obviously, like you said, that the pure raw athlete of Jalen Wright is phenomenal. He's one of the best, if not the best running back in the nation when it comes to all of that. The question really comes with him is going to be vision, consistency, and kind of handling a workload, which he really didn't handle a ton of at Tennessee. So he's in my top 10, just not this high. I do really like Jalen Wright. And like you said, if the NFL disagrees with me and he's all of a sudden gets day two draft capital, I'll move him up to four, five. I don't really have an issue. I, I really do think that this draft class is going to be filtered like that. So we'll talk. I'll talk about him a little bit later. Not too much, but 
um, because you just kind of hammered it home there with him. But I do like Jalen Wright, and I, I think four is not a bad spot if you're really invested in him, especially in this class. No, I was just – a lot of these guys um, kind of trended the same way it felt like where you kind of had your big guys and then you had your small, fast guys. And, you know, uh, besides Trey Benson, to me, he really stood out as just like, oh, that's a dude. Like, you know, when he figured it out, uh, like, it's going to be scary. And uh, his home run ability was what really had me kind of – so I because I think that's the kind of thing that's really going to – that plays on NFL coaches where, yeah, he goes from maybe being a day three guy to being now a, a late or high day two guy. Uh, and kind of, you know, you start to hear about him in the practice reports and in the preseason, but and the next thing you know, an injury here, a thing there. And, you know, Jalen writes the next superstar that nobody saw coming out of this draft class, except that, you know, again, when I was watching the tape um, for me, it was like, it is Barry Sanders esque. Uh, not saying that he's Barry Sanders even a cop to it, but just the fact of you know Barry Sanders would have ten runs for ten yards and then pop that one for eighty. Uh, Jalen Wright kind of has a little bit of that to his game in the sense of like I totally agree with you that if you're telling me he's uh, a guy that's not going to carry twenty five uh, carries a game, for sure I agree with you. But the the fifteen to twenty carry range where he could just pop huge uh chunk yard plays that's kind of how i view him and that's almost to where the nfl is trending nowadays of like having a couple guys in your backfield and you know i'll take again the efficiency of uh the, a guy like a jalen wright who can get me the 100 yards on only the 10 to 15 carries because he popped two huge runs. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I can get behind that. I, I 100% could agree with that, especially with, like you said, the direction the NFL is going. You, if you're not getting that workhorse, you really want those guys that could pop one of those off, you know, the Devon A. Chains, the um, – even James Cook, like those guys, types of players like that, that aren't necessarily getting like the huge volume numbers, but they have that ability to give you a potential to rip off a 40 or 50 yarder. Um, so I, I agree. I like that with Jalen, Wright. My, my concern is, is that he's just going to be a speedy guy that because of his vision issues just kind of disappears. You know, um, I've seen some of people on Twitter uh, kind of compliment Israel of and I can totally agree with that. I think that that's a really good comp at the, at the collegiate level, you know, the production hasn't been there in the sec for a reason. Um, and it's not because of limited touches, especially in an offense that has a huge spread um, formation that really lightens the boxes. You would kind of expect Jalen Wright to probably have had, better numbers in my personal opinion with how explosive athlete he is. Um, so I still have some questions. I got to really dive in again because I haven't really broken down him fully yet. So he's still a little bit lower. I mean, I think he could rise some because the guys that are ahead of him aren't overly great either. So I still, still not out on him. I just, I, I'm not comfortable yet putting him as high as you are. And if you are, I, I totally, I can respect that. I, I think you make a good case for it. I just, I just can't get there just yet with him. And I'm fine with that because exactly like you said, of uh, he could rise for you. He could just as easily fall for me. Like if the draft capital isn't there, uh, you know, come draft time or if the landing spot sucks or, you know, whatever, whatever, um, you know, the vision doesn't develop. It could be a million things. Um, I would just like you said, I would be completely out and I, I would, you know, I have other guys lower on the list that could easily rise up my list. Um, mm -hmm. even one that I, at one point he was on the list and he was off the list and then he was on the list and he was off the list, <laughs> and he was back on the list. He finally finished at eight, so we'll get to that guy later. But I I felt that very much with the running backs all the way through. With the wide receivers, um, you know, just I've done this show, these shows kind of filming them, uh, breaking the fourth wall. I filmed them backwards where I did the wide receivers first and the running back second. And with the wide receivers, like the top of the wide receiver food chain is pretty well set in stone. And then it's like it kind of gets interesting the lower you get. Whereas – 
with the running backs, literally from one to 10, I'm like, honestly, you could say anything to me and justify it. Uh, and I would, I would be fine with that pre-draft. And I, I think obviously a lot of this is going to, this is especially of all of the positions from quarterback, wide receiver, running back and tight end. This one, the most I feel like is going to be affected by the draft capital and the situations that they land in. Yeah, I agree. I like hundred percent. Uh, number five for me is Bucky Irving. Um, I think he had a little bit of a disappointing combine. I wish he ran a little bit faster. Um, starting to get the, you know, like the Devin Singletary, I, I believe, uh, Daniel Jeremiah mentioned that at the combine. I really kind of like that. I think that that's kind of a, a fair comp to kind of, if you're expecting to get out of Bucky Irving, um, but a really good dual threat type of runner. He runs really well in between the tackles. He can be a, um, he has that quick lateral agility, much like Blake Corum to kind of make guys miss in the hole. He also has that good acceleration to pick up those quick short yardage. And I, I had questions. I didn't think he had the long speed and it was obvious um, at his 40 time, but what was surprising is some of his explosive numbers were also pretty bad. If I remember correctly in like the vertical and the broad jump. I think he almost finished dead last. One of them was dead last. It might've been the broad jump. Mm, might've been vertical. I don't remember exactly. Let me pull it up. Cause I, I have it actually right here. Uh, uh, I think it was broad jump. Nope. It was second in the broad jump it was only nine foot seven was second last of the combine. And then it was the vertical His vertical was only 29 and a half. So that was worse than Braylon Allen, worse than Dylan Johnson. Um, pretty much all the running backs there. So I thought that number would have been a little bit more impressive. Um, just because of how quick and laterally he does move well. Um, so there's some questions still with Bucky Irving, but he's really electric on tape and it's hard to take that away from him. And the tape doesn't lie. It's the old antage. And um, so I really think I want to see where the NFL puts him and kind of unmurkies this, but I could make a case for him as high as two. So I left him at five for now, right in the middle. I have a really stupid question. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so when they test your vertical jump uh, at the combine, do is it like, I have to imagine, like, so is it like on a stick and they lower it based on your height? Is that how it works? Or like, no, like, it's just, a, well, yeah. A taller guy would have a higher vertical because he can just reach higher and slap the thing higher, right? I'm not so sure like, if they move the pole <laughs> higher or if they, I've never really like thought about that before, but like, think about if Bucky Irving, they adjust for that. Nine, you know what I'm saying? It's like, if he's got to jump as high as a dude that's six two, who's just got a longer wingspan, like there, I know they must account for it somehow, but it's just funny in my mind of like picturing Bucky Irving being like pissed off that he's got a, he's like, this is not even fucking fair. Like I, I got to jump <laughs> and I'm slapping as high as I can. I'm jumping higher than that motherfucker, but I have a lower vertical because I can only reach so high. Yeah, no, they have, it's like a, the, it has fins on the pole. And I know they they spin some back and spin them forward, and then when they jump, it hits a spin, and then they measure it from there. So they probably measure that height, and then they go off of your height. So like, okay. if you were if you were five nine, you probably jumped whatever. I was gonna you know, say they got to be measuring what like is that? From probably a hundred some inches. Ground. Yeah, no, I think they no, would no, go no. like from if you're you're five nine, you're sixty some inches, and then you jumped a hundred. You know, like you're. That's your forty-inch vertical or whatever. Well, then it's I think the that's reverse. exactly he how they do. Had the advantage, and he did, and he fucked it up because he's smaller and lighter. It should have been easier for him to get more. Well, that's sort of, yeah. And normally, because you're you're just standing straight, you're you're not running. It's just a, a straight, st stale like vertical. So you're just jumping straight. So normally, it's an explosive type of drill that kind of shows that that ex explosiveness. At least that's what I take away from it. Same. Um, and it wasn't there for me, which is a little concerning, but the tape shows it. So I'm not overly concerned. Could have just been a bad day, but I'm less, I'm not overly concerned with it. I just really didn't move the needle for me. He fell some like in my overall rankings, but not really at the running back group. That's actually one thing though. Um, you kind of reminded me 
I thought there was going to be more correlation, I guess, between the jumping and the drills. Uh, and when I say that, uh, I'm talking about the uh, vertical jump and the broad jump compare, as compared to the three cone and the shuttle. Because um, traditionally, like in football, like the reason you're doing a vertical, a three, or sorry, the reason you're doing a 40, a uh, three cone and a shuttle is because it's supposed to be measuring ideally speaking your straight line speed your agility and your acceleration right and then obviously with the with the jumping it's your straight up and then how far um so yes you would expect like the jumping to be almost representative of especially the acceleration and so like in my mind it was like the guys that would have higher jumping would be doing better on the shuttle but oftentimes it really didn't correlate. It did like it, there just wasn't any correlation. It was just kind of randomized. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. that's kind of like, I thought there was going to be a connection there. And then just, you kind of realize like there really wasn't, but I do agree. Like it's indicative to me more of their overall ability as an athlete in general, as opposed to just like the straight connection to like, uh, their acceleration in terms of like running on a football field. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, saying, I, just... you know saying? I sound like fucking Jared. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I just, I don't know. I was a little disappointed from him, but he's still a five. I think that there's still hope. I just want to see where he falls. For me, he was a little bit lower. He was actually at seven. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of, this is the part of the list that's going to get a little bit jumbled. Uh, we're still at number five, uh, but kind of spoiler alert, my number six was Jonathan Brooks. That's where he fell because of the injury. And then right after him, I had Bucky Irving, who, again, very much to me, could he could rise as high as, like you said, literally as high as two. Uh, you said Devin Singletary. I was a little more generous. Honestly, I thought he was slightly bigger Darren Sproles. Uh, mm -hmm. He kind of reminded me of that because of very much the lateral quickness especially not as much uh straight line speed but very good in the passing game and and shifty runner um but the guy that i had at number five and honestly of all the tape that i watched i think i ended up being the most enamored with audric estime who steamed up a big pile of deuce at the combine and had people worried because he ran a 4-7. And honestly, it literally doesn't matter. Uh, when I watched game tape, he exists in his own vortex. He is almost like using reverse speed force to slow down defenders as they approach to try and tackle. It was like that scene in uh, Justice League when the flash is like trying to use his speed force against Superman and Superman kind of looks back at him and is like able to move in the speed force. Uh, that's what Audric Estime felt like to me, like the, the Superman moving in the speed force where it's just like the game almost seemingly slows down around him. And besides the four, seven, everyone's oh the four, seven, the four, seven, you talk about the explosivity. He put up a 38-inch vertical, a 10-and-a-half-foot broad jump, 23 on the bench. He was a solid athlete. He's a By the way, he weighs 220-some pounds. That's what I was going to say. He's 5'11", 221. He is a physical runner. He's got game speed. He just refuses to go down. He has goal line potential, patience, and power, and – this guy is the master of the hurdle. Every time I watch a highlight, this dude's hurdling someone, but he doesn't do it like the way where it's like super high up and like you're getting tackled and like dropped on your noodle. He was uh, doing these really smooth, like low, low hurdles, just kind of getting, being shiftier than you would think for a guy his size. Um, and again, it was very much like, reverse speed force of like it doesn't matter sometimes how straight line in a 40 fast these guys are he 
he honestly uh, was one of my favorites to watch when I was actually going through like all the tape. I was like, I couldn't believe, and he had hands. There was he was making one hand catches, like he was doing everything you could possibly want from a running back. And the fact that Notre Dame, after being maligned for being a non-running back producing school for like generations, it felt like. Uh, might finally have like two really good ones uh, that they can kind of put their cap on with uh, Kyron and potentially we'll see with Audric Estime. Yeah, Estime is my six. So this kind of leads in perfectly. Um, but yeah, I think you go, you have back to back 900 yard rushing seasons at Notre Dame, back to back double digit touchdown seasons, over 100 yards receiving in both seasons. And like you said, he, he's, when you're asking him to go laterally, you're in some trouble. Um, but once he gets downhill, look out. Um, he has that ability to kind of make some guys miss. He will run you over if he has to. And I really do think that he's a sneakier athlete than people wanted to give him credit for. Just they think he's a bull in a China shop, which he can be if he has to, but he's not necessarily that athlete. He does have some wiggle to him and that ability to kind of get into the open field and break some runs. The four sevens concerning, but again, we've talked about it plenty of times on this episode already of just the long speed is a indicator the NFL uses, but they don't also take a ton of stock in it. You know, you've seen some clips. The one that reminds me is because it was this year's combine, like when the bills were drafting Gabe Davis, like they were, they knew that he wasn't necessarily a long speed guy, but they're like, as long as he hits four or five, like we're all right. Obviously, Estimate four seven is a little bit concerning. Um, the only issue I don't have him so high. And I mean, we're talking one spot here between both of us. The issue that I have, I think this is where that tear break starts just because yes, he has some pretty good hands, but I think he ends up being that like Damian Harris, um, David Montgomery early down kind of bruiser, get downhill unless he becomes a red zone guy like Montgomery has been, or Jamal Williams was for the lions. Like it's going to be hard for him to be a consistent fantasy asset. So I do think that there's potential for a high end ceiling here. I don't know if he will ever get there though. I think it's more likely he doesn't. And he kind of gives us some, some good work on the ground as far as a ground and pound type of guy, really good NFL player, but not really a fantasy type of player. So, Landing spot could change it a little bit, but I really do. I like Estime. Like you said, I, I the tape is fun. Turn it on. Watch it if you haven't. It's really it's really a fun watch, and no matter what game you pick from him. So I did enjoy it. I do like him as a player. I just feel like this is that start of that tier of where there's a lot of question marks around all these guys, and you can make a case either way. Yeah, no, I, again, I couldn't – put him any higher for sure and i agree with you that um this the four seven is concerning once you get to that next level but again it's every time i went back to the tape i was like the speed doesn't matter for this guy he's just mm -hmm. it, it doesn't it's not part of his game anyways so you know and it's not like he can't run a straight line uh if he gets like a wide open gap he did do that occasionally um but yeah it's more like uh, the things that I think are going to translate, and you mentioned, uh, I think he could be David Montgomery, uh, but even a little bit better uh, in terms of like uh, the receiving game. And I do think that he's going to translate, especially as a goal line guy, because his his break tackling ability, I think, is especially what's going to translate at the next level. Yeah, no, I, I can agree. Um hundred percent with that. I, I don't think that he can't be the pass catcher. I just think the NFL will typecast him. That's all. Yeah. Because you'll see that. Like you mentioned earlier, I don't remember exactly who we were talking about, but the NFL wants to go with multiple runners for certain t tasks. And if I have a choice as an NFL GM, I'm not going to give Audrey guest made the third down work. I'm going to give him my first and second down carries. And unless I've got goal line work, that's not going to translate to a ton of fantasy production. There could be some in there, you know, it's going to be Brian Robinson jr. You know, that's a right. very good comp at the moment of like an active player in a role. I'm not saying they're the same player, but like, that's the role you're probably going to get out of Audrey Gustime, which has frustrated people and also had people static for times. And the, the volumes there and the touchdowns are there. He's going to be great. 
but if it's not, you're going to have some hair pulling moments. Uh, so who do you have at number six? Because I have Jonathan Brooks, like I mentioned earlier, due to the injury. Uh, number six for me is Marshawn Lloyd. Um, transfer guy, a little bit undersized at five foot nine, but he does come in at 217, which is pretty good. Um, as far as a thick type of player, he ran under 4'4", which is really nice to see. He's kind of an explosive athlete, both laterally, vertically. Good hands, dual threat type of receiver out of USC. So I do like his game. I think that he could translate to an every down type of back. Uh, I don't think he's like a workhorse, but I do think he could be a split type of backfield guy that can play every single down. So that's what I like about him. I think that there'll be some value in the receiving game. I think there's some value in the run game. I just don't know if he's going to, I don't think he gets a workhorse role. You know, he's going to be that split kind of a similar to like what Naeem Hines was for a while in Indianapolis, similar to I'm trying to think that's not who I'm comp to, but um, I think let's see, let's pull his up real quick. Look, um, he's more of a thick boy at five, nine two twenty. He's more compact. He also uh, was impressive on the bench, uh, hit 25 on the cool. bench. Yeah. Khalil but, Herbert, Jalen Warren. Daryl Henderson at their peaks. You know what I mean? Like those are the guys I have in comp to. I think like those type of roles where you're there's viability there, but just not consistently. And it's really going to kind of be dependent on the other paired running back that he's with is kind of what his role will end up being. Yeah. I liked him a lot too. I actually had him at number nine, so a little bit lower on my list, but again, it's just the way that things broke down for me. I really liked Jalen Wright and Estime, So I had them a bit higher uh, and that just ended up pushing down. Uh, you know, I have Bucky Irving uh, at seven. I, I had Jonathan Brooks at six and Marshawn Lloyd. Spoiler alert, I had him at nine. Uh, so, you know, mine are getting kind of outed here a little bit. Uh, who is your number <laughs> seven? Maybe let's hope I don't get out you again here, uh, but I might. Maybe not. But uh, number seven for me is Will Shipley out of Clemson. 5'11". 205 um, dual threat type of guy. I think that the fantasy community is not totally in on him, but I think the NFL community will be uh, again. He's, he's one of those kind of similar to Lloyd. He's very good runner of the football in between the tackles outside the tackles. He's not the fastest guy in the world, but he's going to definitely make you miss if need be um, in the short areas of the field. And he's, he's an extremely good pass catcher. Like this isn't just like, I would, I give you a, uh, you know, a swing pass or anything like that. He's going to be able to split out wide and be used as a weapon in the passing game, as opposed to just like a safety valve. So I think that there's going to be some, some NFL teams that really fall in love with Will Shipley. And depending on the situation, we could definitely get one of those guys that is a third down monster for us and not necessarily like, by no means is the Elvin Kamara talent, but you know, a guy that's catching a lot of passes similar to like the Elvin Kamara's, the James cook, the um, Rashad whites, like the guys that are giving us a ton of PPR points based on catching the football. And I think Will Shipley could do that for us. So questions, obviously still, you kind of reduced a little bit in the, in the run game here at Clemson this past season. And I still, do worry about the long speed and overall and elusivity in the open field. So there's a lot of questions still with him, but enough where I have him inside my top 10. I think the, the pedigree that he comes in with um, out of high school and then obviously playing in Clemson will earn him a little bit in the draft capital category. And I think the NFL will find a role for him in the right situation. Come on. All white receiving running backs have to be compared to <laughs> Danny Woodhead, obviously. <laughs> Or Rex Burkhead, those two. Yeah, they, they have to be a they have to be a page ex Patriot running back. Exactly, that's where he's going to get drafted. By the way, as well, Shipley. Yeah, uh, he's probably my biggest snub on the list. Um, you know, I like. I thought yes, he's good in the passing game, but uh, I just wasn't as enamored with uh, his like regular rushing work. I, I was like, he's fine, but they're just. I was uh, some of these other guys were just a little bit more spicy for me. Um, and yes, this is where we deviate, uh, is, uh, obviously Bucky Irving at number seven, but my number eight was Isaiah Davis. Uh, and he was the one I was talking about earlier. Like I kept taking him off and putting him back on. And I was like, is this guy Edgar and James or Edgar and lanes? Like, I can't really decide 
uh, you know, what he's going to be at, at the NFL level. But a uh, little bit of a obviously smaller school, South Dakota State, but he's six foot two eighteen. He's fast and he's strong, all around runner, uh, and just was very productive. So uh, I had to basically get him on the list because I just think that he's being a little bit underrated right now. Um, and I think again, very much all of these guys who keep saying it over and over, depending on draft capital, I think he could be a sneaky sleeper that ends up rising up people's boards. Uh, but for right now, I had him at number eight, just above uh, Marshawn Lloyd, who, again, like a lot of these guys, I could easily be flipping them around. Uh, <laughs> I, you, you could, there's at least three or four guys not even on my list that I you could convince me deserved to be in these last spots. Um, but I didn't want to take up, uh, you know, two hours of your time and make this a feature film. So we're only doing <laughs> top 10. That's what happens when you don't have generational type of prospects. You could make a case for any of them because college running backs are usually always productive. Um, and that's the case with Isaiah Davis for me. I have him significantly lower than you. Um, we've seen this type of profile and that was Pierre strong jr. So I don't love him. Um, I could be a slight on my part and maybe he's the snub for me when it all is said is done. Um, but unless the NFL drafts him significantly high, I'm not going to be in on Isaiah Davis. I, I get the, the big physical fast freak type of athletes. That's what we always fall in love with. That's what the NFL falls in love with, but that's just his game and to me, I just not refined enough for me. I, I would, I'm still out jury's out. He could sneak in at 10. If you ask me this list post draft, maybe depending on everything, but there's a lot of guys that I still like just a little bit better than him. And I totally get that. Cause again, I kept going back and forth with him very much. And that's why I said, is he going to be Edgar and James or Edgar and lanes? Because mm -hmm. there were definitely aspects of his game where I was like, he's running a bit too straight straight up and you know kind of um is a little bit of a one note runner um but at the same time again like it was hard to ignore the combination of the physical freak uh and the production combined even if it was at a smaller school um and it almost you know means he might be a little bit more of an unknown if if he is able to reach i feel like day two capital though uh that would for me, solidify him in this like back end of like, again, however you're in love with him, anywhere from eight to 10 or, you know, eight to 12 or whatever, whatever kind of deal of like, again, it's like you said, when nobody's great and everybody's good, you can make a case for everybody. But I do feel like there's a lot of really good prospects. Um, and at least some of these guys are definitely going to hit. And we'll be talking about, you know, some of these guys in like three to five years, uh, like the next, uh, Kyron Williams. <laughs> yeah, right. Just takes a year or two. Um, but yeah, eight. What are we at? We're at seven, right? Or are we at eight? Uh, we're at number eight. eight. Yeah, eight was Jalen Wright for me. So we pretty much hammered that one home. Okay. So then uh, let's then, go right into number nine then. Nine for me was Rayshon Ali um, out of Marshall. Six foot, 211 pounds is what I've got him at. Um, we didn't get a lot of them um, at the senior bowl. He ended up having an injury again, a guy that might miss sometime in 2024, but he's battled some injuries the past few seasons, but he's an explosive speedy runner. He's pretty physical. He has a really good dual threat ability. He's put up a ton of numbers in the Sun Belt and for Marshall there in the, the season said he has been healthy. I just think that there's some high end potential here out of Rayshon Ali. I think he's a good patient runner. I think he has good vision. He has really good ability to find cutback lanes as well. Once he's into that second level and Obviously, the entry is the concern, and we're at to see the, the draft capital. But I think that, again, one of those guys that could be a very unsung kind of hero of this rookie draft class if he continues to be suppressed based on just a lack of knowledge. And we're not going to have that advanced data because he's not going to be able to participate in like the 40s and the shuttles and stuff, even at his pro day. So, could be kind of a sneaky name throughout the rookie draft process. If he gets, you know, say that I'm for him would be like fourth round draft capital. I'd be in on him in all of my third rounds. If he's available in my rookie drafts. 
he was actually a guy that I I can't lie. I I really maybe overlooked him. Maybe it was because he was one of the uh, first batch of guys that I looked at. Um, it just felt to me like he was okay. Like he was fine. Uh, but like, even if you were discounting the injuries, like I would have him, uh, lower on, on my personal list. Anyways, for me, my number nine was Marshawn Lloyd. This is kind of where he fell okay. in for me, uh, human pinball that he is. Uh, but Rayshon Ali was actually like, uh, like he didn't even crack my honorables to be honest. There were other guys that, yeah. uh, I was really into, but I feel like, Again, you, we've said it, we're, we'll repeat it, we'll beat it to death. Um, every running back in this class, like, if you like him, you can put him pretty much, like, anywhere from 10 to 20, and it's justifiable depending on how you make your case. So I I totally and I feel like that's that. running back in general. Like, when it's rookie season and, like, right at this point of the season, you're getting an idea of how these shake out. And in general, once you get past the first couple with running backs, normally you could kind of put anybody anywhere, but until you get the draft capital, because that's so important for the running backs, um, just historically, it's proven to be that if they don't get the day two capital, like they don't end up becoming fantasy viable fantasy assets. Let's put it that way. They have their weeks here and there, but they're never going to become a consistent asset that like, we're guessing a little bit here. Obviously our job is to predict the future at this point in time in general, but that's where, like, like you said, kind of, if you like a guy, you can kind of keep him up there floating and hovering around. Um, like I said, he's ranked in my third round of rookie drafts right now. when we're talking this deep in the running back class. So at, in the third round, it's kind of go get your guy in my opinion. Um, so that's where I'm at with him. So. All right. So let's wrap it up with, Number 10, who is your uh, last guy on this list? Uh, so mine's Jace McClellan out of Alabama. Uh, 5'11", 212, kind of an all-purpose, do it everything and anything you need him to do type of running back. Um, he's sneakily explosive. He's got some really good vision. He has good anticipation, runs well between the tackles on the, on the perimeter as well through second and third levels. He's a good pass catcher as well. I just think that he's going to get a little bit more draft capital than we expect. You know, kind of maybe that surprise name like Brian Ta or Brian Robinson was in the uh, year that he was drafted out of Bama. They're just going to take the program, the SEC. I think the NFL will take that into consideration. And McClellan might be a guy that gets drafted a little bit higher than people think and hopefully potentially in a good situation. And I think he could be sneaky, decent, like not great, but he's going to be a decent asset for us, much like Brian Robinson. You know, like you'll have his weeks or his, his short span, a couple weeks here or there in the season. But for the majority of it, he's going to be kind of like that hovering running back two, three. If he gets in the end zone, he's going to give you a top 24 finish. So I love that we were able to kind of deviate towards the end of the list. This is why, again, breaking the fourth wall. Initially, when I was setting this up, I was thinking, all right, let's go 10 to one. You got to save the best for last. And then I was like, wait, the best is actually the last in this case. These last guys, it, it's telling, I almost feel like, of, you know, um, how, do, how do you value players as a fantasy manager? And the guy that really stood out to me, and I went and plucked him uh, from all of this rabble rousers uh, of running backs. And again, keeping with the theme that I think where the NFL is trending in terms of the running backs – uh, we've talked about that as well, this running back by committee and having guys for specific roles. And I really like my home run hitters. And the guy that really stood out to me was Tyrone Tracy Jr. Uh, out of combination Purdue and then kind of switched over to Iowa, I think, at one point. Uh, but he is 5'11", 209. Now the 40 uh, was 4'48", which is fine. But he cracked 681 on the three cone, 406 on the shuttle, dropped a 40 inch vertical, a 10 and a 10.4 inch uh, broad jump. Like, very much a do it all player. Uh, he was involved in the return game. He was uh, involved in the deep receiving game. Like, I'm not talking screens. I was watching this guy go down 50 yards downfield, catch bombs like he was a wide receiver. Uh, you know, he also. Showed a little bit of power, 
um, kind of some tra- like some traditional running back skills. So he's not, I think, in danger of just getting flipped over to you know a, a wide receiver like a hybrid or something. But man, when you're a running back that can return the ball uh, in terms of like kickoff and power return and catch passes and just uh, be a do it all guy like that. And the speed that he had uh, in a box, very impressed by Tyrone Tracy and what I saw from him. And again, a lot of these guys, you know, this could burn up in the ether if he ends up not getting drafted or drafted like in the seventh round or whatever. But I think NFL teams, again, are kind of trending towards these specialized role players. And I do think there's an NFL team out there that might fall in love with a Tyrone Tracy. And if he ends up going, you know, you said earlier uh, how if certain guys go in that fourth, fifth round, you'll take the shot on them all day in the third and fourth round of rookie drafts. I'm very much that same way because that's a lot of the guys that I end up studying and targeting and looking for anyways, because in dynasty, I usually trade away my first and second round picks. Uh, to kind of beef up my teams and be really competitive. I'm very much always in win now mode. I play one year at a time. It's just, that's my style when it comes to dice. I know it's not the greatest, but that's what I do. But he's the type of guy that I feel like, again, can kind of slot into a running back by committee and very much have a role kind of be again, like a fourth, fifth round guy that you target in those back half or rookie drafts. Uh, so I kind of wanted to slot him in at number 10. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't watched a ton of Tyrone Tracy. I have to go back and really dive into him. I wasn't a name that I'd expect I'd be talking much about, <laughs> to be honest, this this draft cycle. Um, so I do have to go kind of really watch more on him. Hey, you wouldn't be on the worst but... fantasy show if I wasn't <laughs> talking about Tyrone Tracy as my number 10 people. And this happens all the time. Like in my fantasy career, it's like, I find an oddball guy where I just fall in love with. Uh, and it somehow some, a lot of the times it works out for me. I don't know what it is. I'm just a dog chasing cars over here. Uh, but before <laughs> hey, we so start, it works, out, out, it works it, out, you know? Yeah. I was at Puka Nakua last year. So like, you know, Puka was actually one of my guys. I mean, Puka yeah. and Shane, and then the year before, uh, I had to be patient with him, but Kyron Williams was very much like a character guy that I drafted, mm-hmm. and I had to just hold on to him. Uh, Romeo Dobbs was another one. Like, it's just some of these guys, I just kind of, I don't know, I fall in love with them. It's weird. I've had my fair share the other way, too, though, so, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah. Jalen Tolbert was that. I, I was about to, <laughs> Joel Bear was the other character guy in the yeah. same year as Kyron that really didn't work out. Yeah, it goes both ways. You have your wins, you have your losses. Before we sign off officially, though, just a speed burst round me some honorable mention guys that you know you were fighting with to crack the list. Yeah, I mean, I really like. Um, I think Cody Schrader's a guy that we got to keep an eye on. The combine was not favorable to him, but did lead the SEC in rushing out of Missouri. Um, Only he's had two years actually running at the running back position. Um, So he's kind of a little bit raw -er as a prospect. I think that there's some potential there. Little undersized type of player. I think Isaac Garundo, the tape doesn't really line up with what he did at the combine, but that combine was really impressive. I think that there's going to be potential that he maybe gets pushed up a little bit in the, in the NFL draft and maybe in the right spot. Maybe there's some love there. Uh, I would say, I mean, obviously we got Frank Gore Jr. Could be interesting. A little bit undersized guy. Very productive at Southern Miss. Carson Steele's kind of fallen off. He was a really productive guy at Ball State before he went to UCLA. Had a modest year. It wasn't terrible. Just hasn't had heard much of a buzz around him, but he's kind of one of those like got a really good workout freak. The guy looks like a Greek God with the looks like Thor out there, with the long hair and just shredded. So curious to see what he looks like if he, if he runs or anything at UCLA's pro day, because he wasn't invited to the combine. So, which was interesting. So that's not great for him, but could be interesting. Uh, yeah. I think that there's a lot that you could really toss out there. Dylan Loeb out of New Hampshire has been kind of a, a guy that a lot of people are talking about. So I think there's a lot, I think, 
again, not to beat the dead horse, but it just the draft capital is going to be key here for these running backs and kind of what the NFL thinks of them and where they're going to be. If there's room for uh, immediate impact, if not, there's likely not a huge path for them for us for fantasy managers. I am so glad that you said that about Isaac Garendo because he was the guy that after the combine, I was like, I went, I went in with the predilection thinking, oh, Isaac Garendo is going to be one of my sleepers. He's definitely going to crack the list. He's going to be, you know, eight to 10, maybe spicier. Maybe he gets as high as five or something. No, I watched it. I watched the tape. He did not pass eye test for me. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't care what your combine numbers are when I'm watching you not be able to break arm tackles on a consistent basis. That was something that was like really scary for me. There was someone last year that ran really fast and was a bigger athlete too. That just didn't really, it was, I think it was out of Florida international. I can't remember his name though. But it was another guy uh, kind of like Garendolo. He was a, he was a bigger, bigger bodied runner, but he ran like crazy 40. And I think he had some other impressive numbers and then he didn't even get drafted. I remember that, but yeah, not saying uh, that's going to be a, a Garendo, but no, I could be. for me though. Um, some of the guys that really stood out when I was uh tape dogging here, the biggest one that I really wanted to get on my list, that I just couldn't, uh, was actually Kamani Vidal out of Troy, uh, 5'8, 213. I love these little compact guys, speedy, 4'4, 640. He had really excellent burst through the hole. Uh, he did seem to get taken down on long runs, but he was a a uh, quick runner, shifty and elusive, uh, very compact. So he was a guy I liked. Uh, Frank Gore Jr., you already mentioned out of Southern Miss, obviously, uh, the son of Frank Gore Sr., um, 5'8", 201, a little bit undersized, but uh, he was smooth, elusive, again, showed nice bursts, uh, had decent awareness. Another guy I really liked, even though he didn't have the greatest measurables, was George Halani out of Boise State. Uh, even though he's 5'10", 208, uh, put up 24 on the bench. Uh, he had good jump numbers, but low slow on the cone, 7'3", on the cone, 4'3", 3 shuttle. So that kind of knocked him down a little bit for me. Um, Ray Davis out of Kentucky. I really liked him a lot. Uh, he had a lot of patience in the screen game, kind of speedy and strong, shifty runner. Uh, and then last two, uh, you already mentioned like uh, Dylan Lobe and Cody Schrader. Uh, Jace McClellan, Isaac Grendo, uh, so Will Shipley. Like, I'm gonna skip all those guys. Uh, Rasheen Ali, sorry, also. Uh, the other guys that I really, really liked, um, it was Jaden Sheridan. He, again, 5'8, 187, a little bit undersized, but just felt like every time I watched this guy, he was able to hit a second gear where it was like the breakaway speed was one thing, but then when it felt like the guy was reaching for him, oh, there's that second gear where all of a sudden you can't get him. And that kind of game speed, again, is different from a 40 time and translates at the NFL level. Uh, So he was one. And then the other one I wanted to mention was Jawar Jordan. Again, one of these undersized shifty guys out of Louisville. Uh, He ended up not having the greatest 40 time, 4, 5, 6, 40. Uh, but all of the tape basically said that he was a pretty uh, explosive player. The one thing was he kind of uh, felt like he tried to truck a lot of guys in college. It's like that's not going to work at his size at the next level. So that's why he kind of fell a lot further on my list than I think other people will have him. Yeah, I was a little surprised by Jordan's 40. On tape, yeah. he looks a lot faster than 4'5". Exactly. So yeah, the, that was like why I, you know, I didn't want to just not say his name and be like, oh yeah, we ignored him, but he definitely was dinged by that. And then the combination of like, you know, when you try to, you know, almost one of his best runs was like, he basically just went straight and trucked through a guy. It's like, yeah, your size, bro, that's not going to work at the next level all the time <laughs> or very rarely ever. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate so much you uh, coming on the show for the running back edition, especially, Uh, you know, we didn't really get it at the top of the show because I guess I kind of assume that if they're following me, they're following you. But for the sake of argument, uh, (laughs) let the fine people out here know where we can find your work. Yeah, they uh, 
pretty much on X is at Pope's FFH. I pretty much link to everything that I do over there. If you want to, you can uh, head on over to FTNFantasy.com. That's where all the written work and rankings and stuff like that is. And then I do the uh, FTN Dynasty podcast as well. Definitely tune into that if you want. We're going through some good stuff there. It's basically me talking to a microphone, but I do have some guests every now and then. And then I uh, have co host at times with Adam Pfeiffer when we do the prospect series stuff. So we're getting through some of those. Uh, hopefully a little bit more next week. And Jeremy is legitimately one of my favorite analysts to cheat off of his homework. Uh, I've been using literally that. your series of tweets uh, for the combine. Uh, a lot of just the way you put your information together, I just find it really clean and easy to read. Um, I just, I legitimately love a lot of the work that you do. So appreciate huge that. shout out to what you do. I appreciate it. Uh, as a fan and as a fantasy player, because I'm like actively using the information uh, and then using it for my own research. Yeah. At least so I I'm know somebody you, does. That's all that matters. I'm telling you, <laughs> it's worth you it. Want- and make sure that you guys are following at Pope's FFH. And hey, at the same time, if you made it this far into the show, why don't you go super kick that subscribe button? Uh, sharing is caring. You know, dr- drop a follow, drop some comments. Help that algorithm out. And as always, I will catch you guys on the flip side. He's running down the middle by the 50. He's at the 30. He's bare chested and banging his chest. Now he runs the opposite way. He runs at the 50. He runs at the 40. The guy is drunk, but there he goes. The 20. They're chasing him. They're not going to get him. Waving his arms, bare chested. Somebody stop Look that out. man. Here comes-